important announcement. On Wednesday, March 1st, we will have a special church conference. Uh, it says 6 o'clock. That has been moved to 7 p.m. We moved up an hour, so back an hour. So, so not 6 o'clock, but 7 o'clock. Uh, Dr. McCullough and Tish Malloy will be here to make a presentation to the congregation. The presentation will be about the future of the United Methodist Church and the discernment process that we are currently later we'll consider uh, this affiliation process. So that's been moved to 7 p.m. Uh, today's the last day to give towards sending a child to New Day Camp. Uh, the cost per camper to attend is $650. And so far we've collected $780, so we've got enough for one kid to go. It'd be great if we could send two. Also, Jewel Keeler, or as you may you may know her as uh, Lynn Scruggs' mom, she's going to celebrate her 104th birthday on Saturday, the next Saturday, at the Blanchard Church of Christ from 2 to 4. So uh, we know she's had a hard life because she raised Lynn. Um, if, you, if you don't know his brother, Dwayne, or... Uncle Butch. Uh, I'm not sure who got the crazier of the two, if we did or somebody else did. So she's had a wonderful life to be 104. She's still hanging in there. Other activities on the back of your bulletin, uh, people we want to keep in our prayers. There's also an opportunity on Tuesday. Right now, four of us are going to go tarp a roof at Seminole. Uh, if you think you want to go with us, going to be up on the roof trying to trying to uh, waterproof this roof who the, the family is waiting on some assistance to be able to get a, a new roof put on the problem is that the the process of doing this with aid and people who can provide services for that, that that's moving very slow and it's been tarped once we're going to have to do it again uh, so that they can so that we can minimize any damage to the house so if you want to go help us uh, Tarpa Roof. It is a Recovering Oklahomans After Disaster Project or road. Uh, we will meet a guy there, uh, one of the road guys to uh, help us. And so if you want to go, let me know. The Lord be with you and also with you. As we enter into worship on this first Sunday in Lent, let us open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and let us be receptive to his leading in all that we do today. Let's stand together and sing our introit. I love to tell the story. It's number 156 in the hymnal. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be Tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And verse 4, I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. When in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme. 
Please join in our call to worship. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all those who are repentant. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we will lament our sins and acknowledge our brokenness. God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, grant us your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There's one thing I forgot to mention, uh, and that is that you notice uh, we're wearing some decoration here, and it is in support of Francis Bunch, who is going on, who is on the walk to Emmaus this weekend at Canyon Camp. So we are glad uh, that she is doing that. Good for her. Let us sing number 73, O oh, Worship the King. Worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing God's power and God's love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of God's might. Sing of God's grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, whose chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is God's path on the wings of the storm. The earth with its store of wonder. Untold, Almighty, thy power hath founded of old, hath established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it hath cast like a mantle the sea. Thy bountiful care, what tongue? can recite it breathes in the air it shines in the light it streams from the hills it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain frail children of dust and feeble frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend remain standing and please join with Christians throughout the ages as we affirm what we believe with the affirmation of faith of the Korean Methodist Church, number 884 in your hymnal. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are in the living Lord, for the 
purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. seated. We come to our time of tithes and offerings. I want to thank you again for your generous support of this church so that we can carry out the ministries of the Lord in this community and in the world. And as Ed said, uh, we're taking up collection for sending a couple of kids to New Day Camp. Apparently we're only a few hundred dollars away from that goal. Let me tell you a little bit about a little boy that I had um, when I was a counselor at New Day Camp. He was about 10 years old. Both of his parents were incarcerated, and he lived with his grandmother, who was ill. And he was worried to death that she was going to pass away, and he had nowhere else to go. For a week, he was able to get away from his situation and feel the love of God from everybody who was around him. So if you want to support that, just make New Day Camp on your check, and we will get it to that place. It's a very worthy ministry. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have given us so many gifts that we are just overflowing with what you have given to us. And we thank you for the opportunity to return a portion of it to grow your kingdom in this world. May you bless it to that purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the dark song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise for Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Do I have anybody who identifies as a child here today? Come on up. Let's have children's moments. Surely there's more of you who are young at heart. Thank you. Praise God. 
And you're only as old as you feel, right? Well, good morning, boys and girls. <laughs> How are you? Hi. How are y'all today? Me too. All right. We'll, we'll see about that. Okay. That's nice. So you have you guys ever heard of baptism? Yes? You've heard of it? Have you ever been baptized? Wow. Okay, very good. So I guess you might remember that. Cool. You know, some people get baptized when they're little infants too. Do you think they remember? They probably don't, but you know someone who does? You do? Their parents do? Guys, please. (laughs) Anyway, you know, the thing that I want you to remember about baptism, if you pay attention to the sermon, you might hear it again. Who is the one that does the baptizing? Who? God. It's God. God does the baptizing. He uses human agents to do the work. But baptism is the work of God completely. It has nothing to do with the human person who puts the water on you. God washes away your sin in baptism, and you become a member of his church. Can you remember that? Just remember God. Remember, Jesus is the answer. That's what you need to remember. Let's pray, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us baptism to mark us as your own. We love you, God. Amen. Thank you. You make, oh, candy. Just one. Come on. (laughs) Pass it along, children. You're welcome. He must be doubly blessed today. I don't think I actually said that, but I did say it in my mind. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Today we have so many things to be joyful for. uh, People who are moving closer in their relationship to Christ on the walk to Emmaus. Um, We have the weather getting a little bit warmer, and we have many people to remember in prayer. So let's go before him. Almighty God, we come before you today in your house. We come here expecting to meet you in our worship, and we thank you that you're just here. Whether we know it or whether we feel it or not, you are here with us. You are inhabiting our praises and that you are bringing um, newness in our hearts. We thank you and praise you for that. We ask that you would forgive us for the sins we've committed, for they are many. The Lord, for those of us, including myself, who have already uh, had a little stumble on our sacrifice for Lent, we ask that you would forgive us and help us to get right back up and continue on that sacrifice, remembering that when we give something up, it's so that when we want it, we'll remember what Jesus did for us at the cross. Lord, there are so many people who are hurting and who are ill and who are preparing to make the end of their life's journey, and we pray that you would be in each situation and give them, each person, exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. Help them to trust in you and to feel your presence. And God, we give you thanks for uh, significant birthdays today. And we pray that you would bless all of those who have uh, lived more than 100 years. Um, That's quite an accomplishment. And to me, that's just another sign of your blessing. Father, we pray for those around the world who are not as fortunate as us to come together in safety and in peace to worship you this day. We pray that your presence would be with them and that you would help them and their witness speak to those who persecute them so that they too will be turned 
and be healed by your love. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the uh, revival that is breaking out all over the United States among young people. Hundreds of young people are turning to you and, and embracing new life, embracing your way. And we pray, Lord, that you would protect them from the things that will come along to knock them off that journey. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to spread your revival throughout this nation and throughout this world. Father, we pray for police officers, firefighters, first responders, military at home and around the world, teachers and caregivers, and all of those who make sacrifices on behalf of others. We pray for your blessing, your protection, and your uh, supernatural wisdom. In all things, Lord, we give you glory and honor and thanks and praise as we join together to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain seated for the, <clears throat> the scripture lesson today. It's a video, and it's Matthew uh, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. There should be some sound on that, Jim. Why don't you back that up and I'll just read it while they're acting it out. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw, oh, I'm, I went a little early. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment... Heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, how are you guys doing on your Lent sacrifice? Did anybody give anything up for Lent? I did. I did not follow my own advice. I tried. To, I'm giving up sugar. Not all sugar, just, you know, candy and stuff. 
and I've already stumbled, but I repent, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do a return, but I'm also giving up stuff, as I mentioned on Wednesday night, that um, stuff that isn't welcome in the kingdom of heaven. So I am working on uh, giving up unkind words. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, and our hearts that we may understand the message you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we begin our journey through Lent, and we're going to have a series called Come Follow Me. We're going to be looking at some of the significant events in Jesus' public ministry leading him to the cross. The goal of this is to move from thinking of ourselves as church members to identifying ourselves as disciples of Christ. To be a disciple, one is primarily focused on on following the master, and in our case, Jesus, and to become like him in everything we do. If we simply think of ourselves as members of the church, we're free to come and go at will. Now, in researching Jesus' baptism, there were lots and lots of funny baptism stories. Some of them were so funny, I really did laugh out loud. They were about infants, adults, youths, pastors, and some of the stories were not suitable for Sunday worship. But the one I decided to share involves a toddler baptism on Easter Sunday. As you can imagine, the sanctuary was decorated to the nines for this holy day. The altar was covered with flowers and candles. The boy was wearing large, thick-soled dress shoes for the occasion, And so when the lady minister took him in her arms to put the water on his head, he kicked her so hard she fell against the altar and knocked over the lit candles. The congregation shrieked, and people in the front ran forward to make sure nothing caught on fire. That was truly an Easter to remember. Jesus' public ministry begins with his baptism, and it's so significant that it's recorded in all four Gospels. This is one of the few places in scripture where all three persons of the Holy Trinity are present together for us to see. We see the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we hear God's declaration that not only is Jesus his son, but that God is well pleased with him. Each of the four gospels present a slightly different set of facts, and that's one of the reasons why we know it's true. Eyewitnesses to an event all have a different perspective. And if everyone gives the exact same story, you know it's likely fabricated. I learned that as an insurance adjuster. We would interview all the witnesses to an accident, and then we were able to write a reasonably accurate version of what happened. Let me give you a full account of what happened that day based on the testimony of all four gospel writers. People were being baptized by John at the River Jordan. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. When John saw Jesus coming, he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John tried to deter Jesus from being baptized, saying, I need to be baptized but you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and was praying. At that moment, heaven was torn open, and the Spirit of God descended on him in bodily form of a dove. A voice came from heaven and said, You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. 
Let's look at some of the nuances of this important event in the life of Jesus. His baptism at about the age of 30 marked the beginning of his public ministry. Now, baptism in itself would have been familiar to the Jewish audience because it was similar to Jewish purification rituals. But Matthew portrays Christian baptism as a spiritually invisible sign of cleansing and forgiveness, analogous to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? After all, he's the sinless son of God. There was no reason for him to repent. Yet Jesus said it was needed to fulfill all righteousness. He did this to be in complete obedience to God's plan. He affirmed John's ministry and was able to identify with the people he came to save. John's baptism was a call of repentance and of turning back to God. And Jesus modeled obedience to God for us here. Baptism is an intentional dying to sin and rising to serve God. Out of death comes new life and a new identity as one saved by an overflowing measure of God's grace. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, and the image of it is like a rushing tide. Mark wrote that heaven was torn open. Someone with experience once said, I can verify that a dove coming down on someone with wings flapping is something like a very powerful rush of wind striking your head. The Holy Spirit swooped down on Jesus with purpose and power. Can you imagine the sheer glory of seeing the Spirit of God and hearing the voice of God? Baptism is one of two sacraments recognized by the United Methodist Church and most churches and Christian religions in general, and it's a work of God. It's not of humans. Therefore, it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime event. The effectiveness of our baptism does not depend on the authenticity of our response or on the holiness of the person administering the water. It does not depend on the amount of water involved. That's one of the mysteries of faith. Baptism is both 100% a work of God's grace and our part is to accept his grace. It's a public and visible sign of an inward and personal grace that brings us to salvation and launches us on the road to holiness, both personal and social. Baptism changes our identity, and as a result, it should change our witness in the world. Now, I think personal holiness is easy enough to understand. Repentance, prayer, Bible study, giving, etc. Social holiness, though, is not well understood today. Many people confuse social holiness with social justice, and they are not the same. Now, both are part of the Christian life, but you can't have social justice without personal and social holiness. Social holiness means that you cannot be holy on your own. It's not just God and me. We are meant to pursue holiness with others by regularly attending worship, studying the scripture with others, and helping others. As Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We're to help remove the rough edges from each other so that we can all be more like Christ. Many biblical scholars believe that John the Baptist was part of the community at Qumran. You may have heard of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, maybe even the Zealots. The other sect known in Jesus' time was the Essenes, They were a small group of people who wanted to get away from the world to focus their attention on God. They were ascetic, mystic, and messianic. They renounced wealth and material comforts and lived a communal life of sacrifice. These were the people who collected the scrolls of scripture that were discovered in the 1940s and are known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And ritual watching for purification was a hallmark of this group. John's outfit, the man dressed in camel's hair, and his diet, locusts and honey, also fit in with the community there. The site which is recognized as the place of Jesus' baptism is just west of Jericho, about nine kilometers north of the Dead Sea. 
And so it was about a day's walk from Jerusalem to get to the site. The Jordan River symbolized crossing over from the old into the new and living into the promised covenant of God. Now this place is in the wilderness near the Dead Sea, and it also fit with John's description of himself as one crying, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Crowds of people came from Jerusalem and Judea to hear him preach repentance and confession and get baptized in preparation for the coming of the Lord. We often think about repentance as being sorry for our sins, but it's so much more than that. The original word, shuv, means to turn back, as in to turn away from your sins and turn back to God. So not only is it a feeling of guilt or regret for your sins, it's making a course correction in your life by turning away from sin and making your path toward God. Abraham Heschel said that repentance is a change in our conduct that brings about a change in God's judgment. When we repent, we turn away from the darkness and we turn toward the light of God. Now the sacraments are those times when we draw nearest to God, sacred moments. This was certainly a holy moment for Jesus where we see the presence again of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all present together for the world to see. And the words of the Father confirm who Jesus is. God said, you are my son. He made Jesus' core identity and vocation clear. Jesus will live as God's son in perfect communion with the Father, and there is no doubt who Jesus is, whom I love. God publicly declared his complete love and acceptance of his only begotten son. And then God said, with you, I am well pleased. Jesus received an affirmation of his value before he did even one miracle. Jesus knows why he is and what he must do that flows from it. He will not draw his sense of purpose from anything other than the Father's love. Jesus' vocation, his calling, his core identity, his essential nature is blessed and secured by the Father from the very beginning of his public ministry. Jesus must have held on to that and treasured this affirmation throughout his earthly public ministry, and they are wonderful words to remember. Parents, you might remember that such words of affirmation can make a huge difference in the life of your children. Now, there may be other holy moments in your life, but sacraments are common to all. Holy communion is to be repeated often, even daily, according to John Wesley. And baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime event. It is solely a work of God's grace, just as salvation is. The baptizing of a person, whether as an infant or an adult, is a sign of God's saving grace. That grace experienced by us as initiating, enabling, and empowering, is the same for all people. All stand in the need of God's grace, and none can be saved without it. It's an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And in baptism, God claims us as his own. God does all the work. And because God's grace is always sufficient... We do not rebaptize people because it's simply not necessary. At baptism, God's grace begins to work in your heart. A pastor friend of mine once said that additional baptisms are just water. As our appreciation of the gospel deepens and our commitment to Christ becomes more profound, we seek opportunities to celebrate that publicly. We do reaffirm our baptism, and it's a way of responding to God's grace anew. And while it's still just water, we can publicly celebrate some new marker in our spiritual journey. Now, there is not agreement in Christian denominations regarding the baptism of infants. I will tell you that infant baptism has been the historic practice of the overwhelming majority of the church throughout Christian history. And it's somewhat comparable to circumcision in the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't offer specific examples of an infant being baptized, 
But it does offer examples of entire households being baptized, and there is ample evidence in early Christian doctrine and practice that this did occur. Infant baptism rests firmly on the understanding that God prepares the way of faith before we request or even know that we need help. Provenient grace, as John Wesley called it. The sacrament is a powerful expression of the reality that all persons, every single one of us, come before God as no more than helpless infants, unable to do anything to save ourselves, not fully understanding how God's grace cleanses us from the stain of sin, and totally dependent on the grace of our loving God. This is true whether you profess your faith and are baptized on the same day, or if you spend months in preparation of your baptism. Many of you might remember that I attended a host of Baptist churches in South Oklahoma City when I was a child and a youth. I still find it fascinating that no one ever approached me about getting baptized, even when I was a youth and old enough in their eyes to answer for myself. Not a single one. Now, I did become a member in some of them, but I guess it was more like a preparatory member. After I spent a few years away from the church, about eight to be exact, I decided it was time to get my two young children in church. My daughter, Jenny, attended daycare at Asbury United Methodist, and I thought if I became a member of that church, I'd get a discount on my daycare. I was all about that. However, it didn't occur to me to ask before I joined the church. Members did not get a discount. But I loved that little church. It was already beginning to decline when I joined, and there were not a lot of people there who were my age maybe five, but I loved the older ladies because they were so kind and wonderful to me. They never got on to me for what I was wearing or what I might be doing outside the church. I don't think they even gossiped about me. They just loved me and accepted me and my wild little children and taught me what it meant to be a Christian through their teaching and example. My children and I got baptized on Pat on Easter because the pastor asked us to. And I remember his 1984 because my son Gary was almost a year old. I do remember my baptism because I felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me as the pastor sprinkled water over my head. I didn't know that was it then, but I remember it. It was a warmth coming from the inside that was new to me, and I knew I had been forgiven of my sins, which were many. Do you remember your baptism? If you were baptized as a baby, you probably do not. But even if you were, you probably still have some pretty early memories that have something to do with your baptism. You may remember the church you attended with your parents. Glimpses of faces of the people who smiled at you and made you feel loved and important. And the Sunday school teachers who taught you about the Bible. Those memories fleeting as they might be, are reminders that your church family fulfilled their promise to help raise you in Christian love. Perhaps you were baptized at confirmation, or if you were baptized as a child and you accepted your baptism during confirmation. At confirmation, you learn the basics of the faith, and you make your own public declaration that you accept God's free gift of grace and promise to live your life for Christ. And if you were baptized and as an adult, you might have sharp memories of that moment and what it felt like. You might be able to recall the exhilarating feeling of the water pouring down on you and the warmth of the Holy Spirit flooding over you. Or you may not. Many people do not remember the details of their baptism, and that's okay. Because baptism is not a feeling that you have. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Sometimes the Spirit shows off. And sometimes it's the small, still voice in your heart reminding you that you belong to God. No matter our age or where we are in our faith journeys, as members of this congregation, we've all taken part in the baptismal covenant at some time or another. Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we all have made a solemn covenant with God to reject the sin in our lives and affirmed our commitment to Christ 
so that we can live our lives to the glory of God as authentic witnesses of the Christian life. We've promised to surround our brothers and sisters with a community of Christian love and forgiveness so they can grow in their faith and be true disciples who walk in the way to life that leads to life. We've just started the season of Lent, and this is a time when we are encouraged to examine our spiritual well-being. We're reminded that Jesus was baptized so that he would know what it would be for us to navigate our journey of salvation as his disciples. Our ultimate goal is to hear the same words spoken to Jesus on the day of his baptism. We are those in whom our Father loves and in whom he is well pleased. Today is a perfect day to remember that your sins are forgiven and to consider the promises made at your baptism and as we witness in the baptism of others. If you've not yet been baptized or become a member of this church family, today is also a great day to consider in your heart if you're ready to make a commitment to the Lord. In this season of Lent, let us make a concentrated effort to surround our church family with a community of Christian love. Let's forgive each other our transgressions, major or minor. And let us be true disciples, living our lives in obedience to Jesus' commands so that we can walk in the way that leads to life. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, thank you for making the way for us to be forgiven and free and completely reconciled to you starting with baptism. You accept us as we come. You wash away our brokenness and sins, and you give us a new lease on life in your grace. Help us to remember our baptism and to be thankful and move in our hearts to see you more clearly, to walk with you more closely, and to become more like your son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of response is probably new to you, You can find it on page 2253 in the black faith we sing if you'd like to look at the music. It's called Water, River, Spirit, Grace. Ed and I are going to sing through it once, and then we're going to ask you to join us the second time through. I was taking just a second to wait for Ed to do the benediction. I guess that's my job, isn't it? (laughs) Please stand for the benediction. In your baptism, you've been marked as a child of God. During the season of Lent, think about that. Are you being a true witness for Jesus Christ? You know you can be. And you can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go this day and share the love of God with everyone you meet. Amen. Thank you.
keep you, may the Lord bless you and keep you all on this day. May his face shine upon you, may his face shine upon you, may his face shine upon you. unto you, may the Lord be gracious unto you, may the Lord be gracious unto you all on this day. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you, may the Lift his countenance upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. unto you and give you peace. Be careful today. God bless.